We are in the book of Ruth. You got to find the book of Judges and then be careful you don't turn too many pages. And so we're, this is our third installment of the book of Ruth. And I, I would just like to explain something real quick uh, to let y'all know that whenever I'm teaching, let me just get a couple principles down. For some of you that have been with us a while, this may be redundant, repetitive. But, you know, whenever we have guests that aren't necessarily always with us, it's important that we try to have some, some ground, lay some groundwork. Amen? Amen? All right. So whenever we're teaching something like the book of Ruth, we're talking about narrative literature. Now, I've asked the people that come here a lot what that means. And last time, I think it was Annette screamed out, I think it was you, a story, or maybe it was Wendy, I'm not sure. It's a story, right? A narrator. A narrator tells a story. And so whenever we're talking about narrative literature, a story is being told. It's different whenever you're trying to find the theology or the or the or the the principles of God's word that he's trying to communicate to us through narrative literature, it's different than whenever we look at the book of Romans. When we look at the book of Romans, he's pretty much, the apostle Paul is telling us point blank, as long as we can understand the words and follow his movement through, the, through what he's trying to tell us, it's real clear what he's trying to say. Now, I will tell you this, that I'm of the persuasion that God is so awesome, he's so magnificent, that he's also a literary genius. Amen? Amen. And I'm of the persuasion that written within these narrative stories is purposefully placed his whole story of salvation for humanity. I'll tell you another thing. I also believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God has written his word two different times. And what I'm saying is this. Yes, it's one collective, cohesive unit. It, the, the scriptures from the Old Testament and the New Testament are cohesive together. Amen. They're in unity and they're telling one story and it's the story of salvation history. A while back, I told y'all that as I was sitting at work, that the Lord showed me this, that the Old Testament was all about bringing Messiah to humanity. Amen. And what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I've shared that with y'all a lot. God's been in a, God's been working. Amen. God does work. Hallelujah. And he's been creating a people for himself. In the Old Testament, he called that man named Abraham out. And through Abraham, he gave us Isaac. And through Isaac, he gave us Jacob. Amen. And through Jacob, the 12 tribes, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And the 12 tribes of Israel in Egyptian bondage swelled to a great nation. And on the Passover night, they were led out through the Red Sea, wandered in the wilderness. But finally, they were brought into the land of promise. Amen. And ultimately, through Israel, he gave us Messiah. What does Messiah mean? The anointed one. In the Greek, it's the Christ. That wasn't his last name. His last name, we don't know his last name. He was probably Jesus Bar, Bar Joseph, okay? Because son of Joseph is what they would have called him, amen? And so the point is this, is that his name is Jesus, but he was the Christ. The word Christ in the Greek means the anointed one. So whenever we're talking about the anointed one, I got to tell you, when you're talking about Messiah, you got the cross all wrapped up in there because it's all about the promise starting from the beginning of bringing Messiah to humanity. God has a plan. And the Old Testament prophets spoke it forth. They prophetically told us Jesus was coming and Israel was waiting. Every day that passed by, they were waiting. Every Passover that passed by and they sliced that lamb's throat and collected his blood, they were waiting. They knew that something was on the horizon. They were a special people called by God. Amen. And so in the Old Testament, God was bringing Messiah to humanity through the creation of this people known as Israel. Amen. And in the New Testament, now he's wanting to bring humanity to Messiah. Amen. And so that's where you and I come in as the people of God. Now, what I want you to know is, is that whenever I teach Old Testament liter narrative literature, I want us to remember something that in the Old Testament, they were Israel. And in the New Testament, name is Christian. And it's almost like they're two brothers. This is an older brother. This is a younger brother. This younger brother right here was supposed to learn from some of the things that the older brother did. You watch this collective journey and you condense this nation down almost as though it was one person and you put a name on him and you watch him wander. 
You watch him wander on his journey, where he goes and what he does, amen, as a collective group of people, but you name him Israel, and you eerily begin to see your own walk with Jesus. You begin to see your faults and your failures. You begin to see how many times you got to repent before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry for all that I've done. You see the sacrificial system time and again and all the types and shadows of Jesus. And you see all of this in Israel and you see the same thing going on in our own life. And the Lord's trying to bring us to a place of fulfillment and to a place of rest. Amen. And I want you to know that he's done that in Christ. And so now we're in this narrative story of Ruth. And one of the things that we know about Ruth is this, is that she was a Moabite. Well, what does that mean? She wasn't an Israelite. She came from another nation. I don't have time to break all that down, but that was a big thing to the Israelites. And so what I'm going to go ahead and now we're going to have to fast forward a little bit. And I want you to see that I believe that God as a literary genius has purposely written books like this. And within it, he has his whole story contained. At some point in time, at the end of the book of Ruth, next week when we teach it, we're going to see that Boaz is going to be called, and we'll see it tonight also, the kinsman redeemer. What does that even mean? Well, you know, there's no sense in hiding anything. Let's go ahead and get some things down straight. What is a kinsman? Somebody kin to you. Somebody kin to you. It's a brother, right? I mean, the concept has to do with a brother. Well, what is a redeemer? Somebody that purchases something back, right? And so what we see in the story is that Boaz, because you see the children of Israel, there was a law in the children of Israel's in the law of the book of Leviticus, something called a Leverite marriage. Whenever a man died and his wife was left a widow, then his brother was supposed to marry her so that she was taken care of. Sometimes they didn't have a brother, so it went to the next of kin. If they didn't have an uncle or a nephew or whatever, then it went to a second cousin. You get the point to where you go down the line until the closest kinsman that's willing to redeem this woman so that she can now not lose her property. Because now that what they were supposed to do is give is give her offspring and that the offspring would continue to keep the father's name that died and he would be able to keep the property. What I want you to know is this, is that there's no reason to, to not just come out and say it. Boaz is a type of Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. He became us. I need you to understand that. See, born of Adam, you were born in sin. Born of your first father, Adam, you were born in sin. Like I told you about the story earlier today, there was a barrier that stands between you and God and prevents you, separates you from the presence of God. But God had a beautiful plan where Jesus, amen, the word who, who spoke the world into existence would become flesh and would take his, his righteousness. His perfectness and offered on the cross and redeem you, purchase you through the shedding of his blood and purchase you back to God. And so that's who Boaz is as a character in this story. He's a he's an older man and he's a man of wealth. Amen. And so really and truly, if you go back to Ruth chapter one, I'm not going to do a whole lot of reading, even though I probably should actually read the first two chapters so that we'd all be on the same page. But let me just tell you a little bit of the story real quick. And those of you that have heard it, just bear with me. There was, a, there was a family, and they were from Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Judah. All right, Bethlehem is the city where, where Jesus was, was uh, born, right? Bethlehem is also the city where King David came from. But interestingly, Ruth is King David's grandma. All right, that's good stuff right there. It's a lot of stuff. We can't get into it right now. All right, because Jesus also came from the tribe of Judah and also was the seed of David. All right, so all this is working way ahead of time right here in the Word of God, and it's staying real true to everything that God said it would be. But there was a man named Elimelech, and he took his family. There was a famine in the land. The name Bethlehem literally means the house of bread, but there was a famine in the land. There was no bread in the house of bread. Have you ever been in a spiritual famine? And so this man named Elimelech, whose name literally means my God is king, takes his family. Now, this is interesting, too. Ruth takes place in the time frame of the judges. And in the book of Judges, four times it says there was no king in those days and the people did what was right in their own eyes. So a man named Elimelech, who has, whose name means my God is king, takes his family in the midst of famine time, gets up and begins a journey of disobedience. God never told you to go to Moab, Elimelech. 
God never told you to leave the presence of God and seek somewhere else in a foreign land to try to find your provision. But nevertheless, that's what Elimelech does. He rises up and he takes his family with him on this journey to this place called Moab and two of his sons marry Moabite women. They weren't supposed to do that. What ends up happening is, is that Elimelech dies and the two boys die. And now Naomi, the wife, whose name means pleasantness, she hears while she's way over there in Moab that there's bread again in Judah, in Bethlehem. The point I made last week when I preached that was this, or whenever I preached it was this. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter how hard you try to run from it. If you've ever cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, I want to know you. I desire for you to have your way in my life. He knows exactly where you are. Even if you're in the darkest alley, even if, you know, you feel as though your life, can't, you know, that there's not going to be any tomorrow. The Lord knows exactly where you are and he knows how to speak to you and how to get a hold of you and how to get you up and back up on your feet and turn you around and send you back in the right direction. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what it means to repent. Go back in the right direction. Direction. Amen. The Lord, help us to go in the right direction. Amen. And, and so there she is. And she says to her daughter-in-laws, y'all need to go. As a matter of fact, that's important enough to read because it's going to have something to do with what we're talking about tonight. Ruth chapter 1 verse 9. She tells them, the Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So this is at the end. I mean, Naomi's heard news that there's bread back in the house of bread. She's made the decision to get up, turn around, and go back. She's telling these old girls, y'all need to go find y'all some rest. Y'all need to go find a husband that you can live with. See, back then it was important, really important to have a husband. Amen? I'm not saying it's not important to have one now. But whatever you do, please make sure you find the right one that really is in love with Jesus. Because if you connect yourself to the wrong one, you just got a bigger mess than what you had before. Amen. Come on, somebody. You can't live for Jesus whenever your man is living in the midst of sin. Amen. Help us, Lord. Right? Men ain't that good to begin with. <laughs> Word of God said to man. <laughs> no, I'm not good. All right, Lord, help me. We're not trying to be funny here. The Lord grant you that you might find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice, and they wept. What ended up happening was, this was interesting to me, the name of the one of the sister-in-law, daughter-in-laws was Orpah, which means gazelle. You know what she did? She took off running. She ran in the other direction. The Lord showed me that this is like the response of two different Christians right here. When the times get tough, when there's times to make a decision, some of them have very little root. Their seed was sown in rocky ground, and there's no root. And when persecution comes, right, they get up, they turn, and they run the other way. But the name Ruth means friend. And Ruth didn't run. She didn't know. This is what Orpah did. She kissed. Kissed is very momentary. It only is a flitting moment, right? And then she turned off and she ran. Ruth, she didn't do that. She didn't kiss. She cleaved. She cleaved to Naomi. And this is what she said. Your God's going to be my God. All right. And so what Ruth decided to do was she turned herself away from her family and she traveled with Naomi back to Bethlehem, Judah. And when they got there, the whole city was in an uproar. Look, it's pleasantness. She's back in town because you remember her name. Naomi means pleasantness. She's back in town. Pleasantness has returned. And what she said was this. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara because the Lord's hand is dealt bitterly with me. Now, if you don't know what Myra means, then I need to help you out. Yeah. The bitter waters of Myra. Remember how I told you when God was creating this nation called Israel and they swelled into a nation in Egypt and then he on Passover night led them out on dry ground and through the Red Sea, amen, and then they began to wander. The first water and hole that they stopped at was at a place called Mara. They went to drink it and the waters were bitter. So they began to murmur and complain as though God couldn't get them where it was that they needed to get. And the Lord told Moses, tell them to throw some wood in that bitter water. And the Lord would tell you and I tonight, sometimes you're going to find yourself and bitter circumstances. Sometimes this life is going to be so bitter you're not going to want to drink it. But if you're going to throw some wood up in the midst of that situation. In other words, put the cross in it. Lord, the cross is an instrument
instrument of death. And I need you to allow this thing that's causing bitterness in my life to die. And I'm asking you, Lord, to replace it with resurrection power so that the life of God would be resident in me. That you'd lift me up, Lord. I don't want to murmur and complain. I don't want to be full of bitterness. Amen. I want to go back to pleasantness. Hallelujah. That's the name that I want. But that's where she was. She's just being truthful. Call me mine. The Lord's hand has dealt bitterly with me. And so in the next chapter, what ends up happening is, is that Ruth goes to work. She wants to go glean in the fields. What does that mean? Well, they also had another law back in those days for the people that were poor and didn't have their own crops, that they would not cut the, the corners of the fields. Remember I drew that for y'all last week. They would leave the corners uncut so that the poor people could come and reap some harvest for themselves. I'm not going to go through all the details, but Ruth found herself in, a, in the best field she could have ever found herself. It says that it says that she hopped upon H-A-P, hopped upon the field of Boaz. At first, I thought that word was just old King James language for happenstance. Accidentally, she showed up in Boaz's field. But when I researched it, that wasn't what it was at all. The word literally meant providence. The hand of God took Ruth and strategically placed her in this field of this man named Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer. God knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. And it's not happenstance when you first ran into whoever it was that told you the good news about Jesus. It wasn't an accident that the seed of the gospel was planted on the inside of your heart. Amen? Amen? And he knows where to place you. Amen. And if you just stay still and let him work in you, hallelujah, he's going to do a work. And listen, Ruth starts getting blessed. Boaz notices her right away. He sees all the hard work that she's doing and, and, and everything. And he's asking questions about it. He says, oh, his, his foreman says, that's that girl that came back with Naomi. Yeah. Remember pleasantness? He came back to town. Everybody's all into a whole city's all a stir about this girl. She, she followed her mother-in-law back. And look at her. She ain't stopped working since she got. Listen, I want you to know something. You want the Lord to take notice of you? Hallelujah. First off, you better learn how to lay at the feet of the cross, number one. Yeah. Number two, let the Lord begin to do a work in your heart. And guess where he's going to put you? In the field, working the harvest. Yeah. Because the Lord is all about the harvest. Yeah. And he desires for his children, amen, and his bride. Oh, come on now, somebody. Ruth's about to get married before this story's over. And she's a Gentile. It's a story about a Gentile bride. What I need you to understand is that the scriptures are full of the theme of a marriage. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And God is looking for a bride that would marry the Son. Amen? And Ruth is a perfect type and shadow of the Gentile bride. And she's about to marry the kinsman redeemer, the Jesus, amen, who died and shed his blood, amen, to, to, to buy us back to the Father. And so in this story, it says right here in chapter 2 that she's getting blessed. Mm-hmm. She's getting, the Boaz is just pouring blessing upon her. And then it comes to a part in the story, I'm about to move forward, y'all hang tight with me, where she just bows down on the ground. She bows down and she begins to worship Boaz. And she says, why in the world would you take such notice of me? Why would you show such favor to me? And I thought this was so good, I got to repeat it again. Verse 11 of chapter 2. Boaz answered and said unto her, it has faithfully been showed me all that you have done unto your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your nativity. In other words, the place you were born. And you are coming to a people which you knew not heretofore. The Lord recompense your work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you are come to trust. In other words, Ruth, you're getting confused. You're looking at me, Boaz, thinking I'm the one that's pouring the blessing on you. But what you need to understand is this. You made a decision as a Gentile bride to turn your back on the first birth that you had of Adam. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about when you were born in the world. You made a choice to turn your back on the first birth born in Adam. You turned yourself from the old ways and the old world, and instead you now have chosen to serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the problem that you're having is, is that you don't know him real well right now, Ruth. But the good news is, is if you stay put, you're going to get to know him a little bit better, and you just happen to walk up in the field of a man that really loves 
loves them. And so the Lord recompense you, Ruth. The Lord reciprocate to you. He's in other words, he's giving back unto you because the word of God says those that draw near him, he will draw near them. Amen. Amen. And so the Lord is now blessing Ruth for the choice that she made to live for God. And he said, this is the God that you chose to find cover. Under his wings. Amen. He's talking about Psalm 91. Moses wrote that song. The, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. He's trying to tell her, Ruth, you don't understand. You don't know the God that we serve. But I'm here to tell you that he led us out in the wilderness with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He gave us guidance. He gave us wisdom. He let us see ahead. And it's not an accident that you showed up in this field, Ruth. The same God that led Israel in the wilderness is the same God that led you into this field. And I want you to know here tonight, it's the same God that led you to the place where you could bow your knee to Jesus. Amen. And if you'll hold on, come on, somebody. Yes, yes. You can't be like the seed thrown in the rocky soil and when then be like Orpah the gazelle. And when times get tough and you don't know what you're going to do, turn around and go run back to the world every time things don't work the way you want them to. You got to be like Ruth and you had to cleave to the God of Naomi. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. Now we're in chapter three. Word of God says right here, Naomi, her mother-in-law said unto her, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for you that it may be well with thee? <laughs> well, you know, I asked you to read with me chapter one, verse nine, because see, in Naomi's mind, rest is her to find a husband. Amen. You remember I showed you that. And so this is what she's talking about. We're about to make a connection now with Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. But you know, yesterday, and we're not going to turn there because I can tell that I'm going to try to be long-winded tonight. So I'm just going to try to speed it up for you a little bit. Yesterday, last night, I was looking at some scripture. John chapter 14 and John chapter 15. Because he, she ends up telling her, telling Ruth in, in chapter 1 or in Orpah, you need to find rest with your husband in your own house. And I'm here to tell you that when you marry yourself to Jesus, what you need to understand is this. The Lord told his disciples in John chapter 14. He said, in my father's house, there's many mansions. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if it wasn't true, then I wouldn't tell you that. But I'm coming back again. Amen. And so what you and I need to understand is this, is that true rest is not in the house with a husband. But instead, true rest is going to be in the house with the husband. And that time is coming and it lies ahead yes. on the future. But until then, in the next chapter, chapter 15, he said, I'm the vine and you're the branch. He said, you must abide here. What is he talking about? The word abide means to dwell or to live in a certain place. So there's coming a time whenever you're going to live with me for all eternity. You're going to be in a house. You're going to be in rest. Come on, Ruth. We're about to find you some rest with the kinsman redeemer. But what you need to understand is that until that day comes, this is where you need to live. You need to dwell right here. You need to be the, the branch connected to the vine, receiving the strength so that you might be able to produce the fruit. Amen. So I just want to encourage you, stay connected to the vine. Amen. How do I do that, preacher? Faith. The way you stay connected to the vine is through faith. Your trust. No matter what you're going through, everything in you has to continue to hold on to Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Why do you keep saying what he did for you at the cross? Because it's his sacrifice that paid the penalty, that removed the barrier, that stood between you and the presence of God. And no matter what you're going through in your life tonight, you need the presence of God in the midst of your circumstances Amen. to minister to you, to strengthen you, Amen. to infuse you with power from on high so that you can do what it is that God's called you to do and that you can walk with him. Amen. Amen. All right. He also said in Matthew chapter 11, because she's talking about rest. He said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. He said, he said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for your weary souls. So you might feel weary in here tonight. Sometimes I feel weary, huh? Sometimes I feel weary and I feel worn out. There's just a lot of things going on. But what the Lord wants you to know is this. And i got to explain this to you. And I know some people that have been coming to the Bible study, you know this. A yoke. What is a yoke? It's not an egg yoke. A yoke is a piece of farm equipment. That would tie two animals together at the neck. And then it allowed the two animals to plow the field. 
So it yoked two beasts of burden together. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. In other words, you quit trying to plow this field. You quit trying to bear this burden. You quit trying to run through this life in your own strength. And instead, you let me be the workhorse. How do I do that? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. You keep your faith in the finished work of Christ, which allows grace to flow in your life. Amen. And strengthens you and brings peace to you in the midst of your circumstances. Amen. Hallelujah. It don't get any better than that. In the next verse, we're going to say it again. Faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because you don't let go of that. Amen. Because that is, you got to understand something. That's the plan of God. He's not changing. It. Amen. And so hold on to it. All right. So he says, she says to Ruth, I need to find rest for you that it might be well for you. And in verse 2, and now is not Boaz of our kinsmen, of our kindred, with whose maidens you were. Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now, I want, you to, I want you to understand something that this is, this is so interesting to me. You know, so, so you got to find rest. And what did we say? We said that ultimately we're going to live in eternity with the Lord out of John chapter 14. But until that day comes, this is what we need to understand. He's going to be at the threshing floor winnowing barley. What are you talking about? You remember the story whenever John the Baptist began to preach? And what did he say about Jesus? He said, I baptize with water for repentance. But there's one that comes after me whose sandal I'm not worthy to loosen. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. He said, his winnowing fan. That's a bad translation in the King James. His winnowing fan is in his hand. And he's going to burn up the chaff and he's going to put the grain in the garner. What does that mean? The winnowing fan was actually a fork. It was a winnowing fork. They would have a pile of grain on the threshing floor. They would take the fork, they would throw it in the grain, and they'd sling the grain way up in the air. And as they did, the heavy grain would fall back down, and the chaff would fly away in the wind. And in the, in the, the way that John the Baptist is talking about it is that the chaff was going to be burned up. The chaff represents that part of man that's not going to be with the Lord. It's that part of man, listen, the Lord wants you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Not just so that you speak in other tongues, but so that you have more of the Holy Spirit burning on the inside of your belly to start burning up some of that stuff, some of that chaff. Lord, baptize me with your fire, amen? amen. And cause that chaff to be burned up that's in that, that tries to remain because that stuff's not going to the garner. What's the garner? The storehouse. It's talking about the harvest. It's only the grain that's going. It's only the true believer, amen, that's put his faith in Christ. And so what I want you to know is this, is that Ruth is seeking, Naomi seeking rest and a husband for Ruth. And there's coming a day when that's going to happen for each and every one of us. But until that day, you can find him at the threshing floor because he's working on the harvest. Amen. Yes, yes. And so I want you to know that, that that's where she tells Boaz, that's where she tells Ruth, Boaz is going to be at the threshing floor because it's harvest time. Amen. amen. You need to get that. Christian, God's looking for a harvest, a harvest of souls, a harvest of humanity. And he said that the harvest is white and it's ready, but pray for laborers. Amen. Amen. Lord, get a hold of our hearts and make us hungry to be witnesses for the kingdom of God. He says, right, she says right here, I thought this was interesting. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint you and put your raiment upon you and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have been done eating and drinking. Now listen, I want to, I'm going to turn real quick to, to Revelation chapter 3. Because what I see about this Gentile bride right here is this. See, Naomi's trying to, trying to connect her to, to, to Jesus, if we would speak in New Testament terms. But many times, like the old church, the way that they think you're going to do it is you're going to get yourself cleaned up and you're going to prepare yourself to go and see him. She told her, she said, wash yourself, wash yourself up, anoint yourself and put on your garment and go down there and see him. But I want you to see what the church looks like whenever Jesus comes back in the end. Revelation chapter three, verse 18. He says right here. Well, let me just start at verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spew you out of my mouth because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, 
Knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich, and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Now, the reason I said all that was because Ruth had all this going on. She washed herself. She anointed herself. She put on a raiment. She put on a garment. And what the Lord's saying right here to the church, amen, you cannot prepare yourself. You can't put on the right garment. You can't clean yourself up enough. You can't anoint your own self to prepare yourself for my presence. We're about to see that Ruth is going to, I believe, what we're seeing in this story is that she's going to realize it. She's going to realize that her covering isn't going to be good enough to get her where she needs to go. Amen. Amen. Now, I want you to understand that you can't. That's what the modern church will tell you. All your you got to be holy and you got to you got to do all this stuff and you got to get yourself involved in all these different things in order to be right with God. No, the way you get right with God is you put you put on the white raiment and the way you do that is through faith and what he has already done for you. Amen. Let me let me just tell you one more thing. Ephesians chapter five, because she told her. Naomi told Ruth, wash yourself. Now we're talking about a bride right here. And Jesus has a bride. And this is what he says. Verse 26 of chapter 5 of Ephesians. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So what I want you to see here is this. Ruth, you can wash yourself, you can anoint yourself, and you can put on your own raiment. You can make yourself look as pretty as you want to, but the reality of it is, is this. Jesus, in the New Testament, and for the New Testament saint, he's the one that sanctifies. He's the one that cleanses. And if you're really wanting to be married to him, and you're really wanting to be cleansed by him, you need to learn how to rest in that. Amen. You need to allow the word of God and the Holy Spirit to have its way with you. But first off, you got to be in the right faith. When you when, Listen, there's a lot of people that preach a cross. I've said this before. They preach a cross, but even John said it the other day. It's not a cross that kills. you gotta have a, you got to have a message that the cross is an instrument of death. And it brings death to the old man. Amen? Amen. Lord, allow that to, be, to work in our lives. And sometimes that's a process, but we got to want it. We got to want him to work that cross in our life. Amen. amen. So that resurrection power yes, can take yes. its place. So, Lord, let us be first in that place where we find ourselves dead in Christ and a new man resurrected. And then allow your word and the mixture of that with your Holy Spirit as water cleansing your bride. Amen. And a process. Listen, man, the Lord wants to cleanse you. Don't, don't let the devil beat you up. Oh, you don't know what I did last night, preacher. You don't know what I did this morning. Listen to me. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Amen. And let the Lord work on you. Amen. And cry out to him and let him know the work that you desire for him to do in you. Amen. All right. It says right here in verse four. And it shall be when he lieth down. I can't help it. I'm just seeing so much here. It's so choppy tonight because I'm just seeing a lot. Y'all just bear with me. It says right here. Shall be when he lies down that shall you shall mark the place where he shall lie down. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what, what you shall do. Now one of the things that, that really stuck out to me was this. Is that if you're going to have a relationship with the kinsman redeemer, you're going to have to lay down at his feet. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to bring yourself to the foot of the cross. But look what she said. She said to mark it. To find the place where he lays and to mark it. It means to observe it and to pay close attention to it. Really, don't forget it. Remember where it was. And I got to tell you something. That when you come to Christ, many times people didn't understand this in the times past. But you got to understand that once you put your faith in Christ and what he did for you at the cross, that you don't just turn around and walk away from that. No, you mark that spot and you stay right there. Amen. Because, see, that's where the old man stays dead. Amen? Amen. And the new man stays resurrected. So, Lord, help us to be reminded where to keep our faith. Yes, Amen. Yes. Each and every day. All right. And so she went on to say, verse 5, and she said unto her, all that you say unto me, I will do. Verse 6. 
And she went down into the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn or grain. And she came softly and uncovered his feet, and she laid herself down. Now listen, I know what your carnal mind wants to do. You want to start thinking that she's coming on to Boaz, and you know, that this is some kind of, uh, uh, you know, no. This is not sexual right here. This is, this is her coming to him and asking for his favor. Because she's wanting him, she understands that he's a close, and maybe you weren't thinking that, maybe I was thinking that, I shouldn't have said your mind was carnal, maybe it was my mind that was the problem, right? So what you want to beat up the people in the church for, right? So, so anyway, it's the preacher's fault, alright? And so, but what I want to say is this, is that I don't want y'all walking out here mad at the preacher, because he said, he said your mind was carnal, alright? So, but what I want you to know is, is that that's not what this is. She's not coming on to him in a sexual way. She's coming to him humbly, amen, knowing that she has nothing and that he is an opportunity of hope and love, amen, and prosperity. And she's coming and she's laying herself down. See, it takes the heart of a person to come to that realization, to, to realize that, you know what, I don't have anything. And somebody told me about this kinsman redeemer. Yes, yes. And I need to come to him. Amen. And I need to humble myself. Amen. And I need to lay myself down at his feet. Amen. And I need to leave myself there. Amen. And if you'll do that, I'm telling you, he'll bless you. But look what he goes on to say, verse 9. And he said, who are you? She said, I am Ruth, the handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Now, I don't know about you, but see this to me right here. It reminds me of the fact that all of her cleaning up, all of her anointing herself, all of her uh, putting on her own raiment is not going to do. When she comes into the presence of Boaz, what she says is, I need you to clothe me. I need you to take your skirt, your, your really it's like a, a cape, and I need you to cover me with your covering. Amen. The word of God says in Galatians 3.27 that when you've been baptized into Christ, you've put him on. You've been clothed with Christ Jesus. The word of God says in Romans chapter 3 verse 22 that there's a certain type of righteousness. His name is Jesus. And when you put your faith in him, it's for all those that put their faith in him that it'll come to them and that it'll be placed upon them. Ruth is the Gentile bride is coming to lay herself down at the feet of the kinsman redeemer. And she realizes that she's still uncovered and she's naked and she needs to be covered and she's asking to be covered with the righteousness, amen, of the kinsman redeemer. And so he said, blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for you have showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. And as much as thou followest not young men, whether they be poor or rich. So what Boaz is saying here, and I mean, we've kind of noticed, at least I have in the story as we've gone forward, more than likely Ruth is a beautiful woman. That's what I'm getting from the story. But not only is she beautiful, she's an extremely hard worker. And she's not just a, an extremely hard worker. We're about to learn in a second that she's very virtuous and that everyone in the town has taken notice of all of the things that she's been doing. Amen. For her mother-in-law. And what Boaz is saying right here is this. You came to chose to lay yourself at the feet of me. See, this is the thing that you got to understand. She came into contact with a real Christian. She came into contact with a real Christian. I know I'm using that term loosely. We're in the Old Testament. Bear with me. I know where we are. All right. She, 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 but she ran into a real Christian. Somebody that really had the love of the Lord in it. He wasn't asking anything back in return from her. He just loved her. And he wanted her to know the love of God. And he wanted to share with her the love of God. Amen. And she saw that in him. And he's saying, blessed are you. Because you didn't run after younger men. In other words, there's a whole lot of other things that you could have went and done. See, we're, remember, we're in the time frame of the judges. There was no king in the land. People did what was right in their own eyes. Yes, yes. Israel wasn't serving the Lord like they were supposed to. The church wasn't serving the Lord like they were supposed to. You get the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah. She saw a real Christian. She ran into the real thing. This is what she wants. She wants to grab a hold of this. Amen? Amen. And he says, And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that you require, for all the city of my people does know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, now, that word virtuous, it can be used in a couple of different ways. Number one, it can describe great wealth. Well, we know that physically, he can't be talking about that because she doesn't really have anything. 
It can also describe great power, might, or efficiency. And I'm telling you that what everybody is seeing in this woman is that she's focused. Everybody in the town has seen what you've done for Naomi. Everybody in the town knows that you left your family and you turned around. See, the truth of the matter is this. Some of you, since you gave your life to Christ, have taken flack, if you will, from family members or past friends because of the decision that you made to turn your back on what you previously knew, amen, and to connect yourself to Jesus. But I'm here to tell you something. Just hold on. Don't get stressed out when they talk bad about you and persecute you. Let the Holy Spirit give you grace to love them back and just give it some time. Give it some time because just like Ruth, they've been watching her get up every morning. They've been watching. She came back with Naomi. Her husband left. She said, you know what? My husband died, but I'm going with Naomi and I'm going to cleave to the God of Naomi. And every morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to go work in this field right here. And I'm going to glean the harvest and I'm going to tote this grain back home. And I'm going to share with my mother-in-law and let everybody in the town know and see that Ruth is a woman that's focused on doing the right thing. Amen. And the whole city was aware of it. And I'm here to tell you something. If you let the Lord do the work that he desires to do in your life, Amen. then you let him make you the witness that he desires for you to be. Amen. Everybody around you is going to notice it. Everywhere you go, they're going to see the joy of the Lord in your heart. Amen. Amen. They're going to see the words coming out of your mouth. Thank you you got to remember something. Amen. Things aren't going good in the physical for Ruth. Her husband died. She left her family. But nevertheless, the joy of the Lord is her strength. He's filling her up, amen. Sometimes things don't go the way we want them to. But Lord, help us. Strengthen us. Because we're still supposed to be the people of God. And he can still put joy in our heart, amen, and give us what we need in order to continue to do what he's called us to do. Amen. Am I, am I preaching the truth? Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Goes on to say in verse 12, but now it is true that I am your near kinsman. How be it, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Uh-oh. <laughs> what does that mean? I, I don't really know exactly what the relationship is, but maybe Boaz is a first cousin to Elimelech, and I mean, I'm sorry, a second cousin to Elimelech, and there's another old boy that's a first cousin. <laughs> and I was just thinking, you know, isn't that just like the sin nature right there? There's a nearer kinsman. Because you see, the first birth of Adam is this physical birth that we're so close to that old man Adam. He just really doesn't want to die, if you know what I mean. He wants to linger around. He's real close. He's a real close relative. And he always wants to remind us. See, as a matter of fact, and, and I'm going to go ahead and just quote it for you. <laughs> Genesis 5.3 says this. After 120 years, Adam had another son, and his name was Seth. Seth was born in the image and a likeness of his father, Adam. See, since Adam fell, every human being that has ever come forth from, that has ever walked on this earth, has been born, if you will, from the loins of Adam. Every human being, except for one, his name was Jesus. Amen. 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 He didn't come from the seed of Adam. He came from incorruptible seed. What I want you to know is, is this, is that the word kinsman means a relative. The sinful nature, spiritually speaking, is your relative. You were born with it in Adam. Good news. Jesus. He's the kinsman redeemer. What does that mean? He became us. He became you, flesh and blood. Not the sinful part of you, but he became flesh and blood. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. It says that because the children were partakers of flesh and blood, he partook of the same. Why? So that he could die. So that he could offer himself in death to remove the power of death from the one that had the power, which was Satan. Amen. And so what I want you to know is, is that in the story, there's a closer relative, a closer kinsman. And you need to remember that that kinsman is going to try to hang on to you and hold on to you and try to draw you back and try to mess up. Get in the midst of what God plans for your life, because Ruth got hope right now. <laughs> Ruth's got hope right now. She's seen the one she wants. She knows that he's going to take care of her. She goes and lays down at his feet, but then all of a sudden there's news. Hold on a second. We can't move so fast. Can't move so fast because there's one that's closer. We need to make sure he's out of the way so that, so that this can go forward. And he tells her to tarry. He says, you just tarry here, which means to abide or to dwell. You know, the truth of the matter is sometimes we just got to stop. Amen. 
We just got to stop and stay in the right place. Hold on to the Lord. Keep our faith focused in what, in what the Lord promised that he's already done. Amen. And if we'll just stay there and, and continue to hope and trust in his plan, then the work of God will be manifest in our life. So he goes on to say, this night, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth. Lie down until morning. She lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could, kn could know another. And he said, let, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. And he said, Bring the veil that you had brought with upon you, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. Interestingly, last week, she left with about 20 pounds worth of grain. Today, she leaves with 60. All right? And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Now this is where I'm closing with this particular verse right here. But I want you to see this. Then said she, Sit still, my daughter. Sit still, daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not rest. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Now I want you to see something right there. The Lord is telling us to rest. To rest in his work. She's saying what you need to do my daughter is you need to rest. You can't change anything Ruth. You can't take matters in your own hands and try to manipulate this situation and try to turn it around for your own good. You can't try to get up out of this restful spot and try to go find out who that other closer kinsman is and try to talk him into, oh, don't buy me, sir. Please don't buy me. Please, no, just refrain. Tell him that you don't want me. You can't do any of that, Ruth. What you have to do is you got to sit still and you got to rest. And while you're resting, you need to know something. The man, he won't rest. He won't rest until he is certain that this thing is finished. You and I need to understand something. When we're going through the things in life and we find ourselves in the midst of trial and tribulation and we find ourselves desiring to go fix our circumstances. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. Trying to take matters in our own hands. Trying to do it in our own strength. Trying to do it in the flesh. The Lord would say, sit still. Sit still and know that I am going, I'm going to war for you. And I will not rest until this thing is finished in your life. But listen, a lot of times that's the problem. We're not resting. We're contending. Listen, contend for the faith, amen? But, but instead what we're doing is we're contending trying to fix the situation. Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is, is that we can't. Amen. And many times the reason that we don't get what it is that we're asking the Lord to give is because we're over there still got our hands up in the midst of it. Amen? Amen. Lord, help us. Word of God says in Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Amen.